Within 24 hours of the warning by the United States about the build-up of Soviet troops and military equipment in Afghanistan, there are reports so far unconfirmed that there's been a coup d'etat. According to the official Iranian news agency, the radio station in the Afghan capital, Kabul, put out a report this afternoon that the regime of President Hafez Zala Amin had been overthrown and that a new prime minister had been installed. It also said that a curfew had been imposed and that the radio was playing martial music. Shah Sawar Sangarwal was a young producer at Afghan National Radio at the time. This is his story. After a normal working day, at 6 p.m., I was about to leave the office and I went to get my coat. It was a very cold day and there was lots of snow outside. As I was leaving, the camera van pulled up outside the office and a cameraman called Omar and his producer, Sadiq, got out. Omar was very scared. He said, I've seen something really strange. I wasn't happy with the quality of some of my filming, so I'd gone back to the palace to film another shot. But when I got there, the guard outside said, go away, don't worry about your video, it doesn't matter. I said, but we can't use it for the news bulletin, it's flickering and I just need another quick shot. Then the guard slapped me in the face and said, go away, don't you see what's happening? Almost at the same moment, I realised that a member of the Central Committee was falling down the stairs outside the building. He was unconscious. I protested and said, what's going on? The guard said, all the members of the Central Committee have been poisoned. There is a serious situation here. Just leave. The Afghan president, Hafizullah Amin, had organised a lunch to show party members the Taj Beg Palace, which he had just moved into. During the meal... Amin and several of his guests lost consciousness. They had been poisoned as part of a coup backed by Afghanistan's massive neighbour, the Soviet Union. The Soviets were concerned that President Hafizullah Amin was leaning towards the USA rather than the USSR, and they had decided to take action. I went back inside to the technician's office, and as I sat down, I heard a gunshot really close by. I dropped straight to the floor. The technician said, let's go down into the studio. Our radio studio was underground. As we were going downstairs, a huge artillery barrage started. There were shells hitting our building. It was like hell. The radio station and the TV station and the Taj Beg Palace were all under attack. The Taj Beg Palace was supposed to be a fortress with walls strong enough to withstand artillery fire. But just after seven in the evening, after paralyzing the Afghan military command, the Soviet forces started firing on it. Meanwhile, Shah Sawar Sangarwal was still in the radio station. There were about five or six people inside the underground studio. Then all of a sudden, two people broke in. I didn't recognize either of them. One of them was wearing a Russian hat and glasses, and I thought they might be Russians or some sort of foreigners. One of them approached me and said in Farsi, What is your name? And I said, I am Shasawar Sangarwal. And he said, I am Watanjar. The man with him was a Russian. Mohammed Aslam Watanjar was an important Afghan general and politician. Watanjar asked me to get some patriotic and revolutionary songs. I went to the archive and brought the patriotic songs and started playing them. One of them was like this. Oh, my dear country, oh, my treasure of rubies. The signs of my sword is all over your valleys. Watanjar was one of the three main figures who were leading the invasion and he was responsible for controlling the media. That's why he came to the radio station. I was very frightened because I could still hear the shelling going on outside. Someone called from the TV station and said they had been taken hostage by foreigners and everyone had been rounded up in the TV hall. They said that their female colleagues were so scared they had wet themselves. Asalam Watanjar said, take me to the TV station. So we showed him the safe shortcut. He released everyone. And then all the radio and TV employees were loaded onto buses and sent home. Their intense fighting stopped 
after just a few hours. On the way home, Kabul was much quieter. It was almost like a ghost town, but there was lots of blood everywhere on the snow. Many people had been killed, but the next day when we went to work, there were lots of Russian soldiers everywhere. The supporters of Babrak Karmo were wearing white armbands to be recognised. There were so many planes flying in the sky that it was almost impossible to have a normal conversation with the person next to you. It was a very unusual, noisy and bitterly cold day. The change of government was almost complete. Uh, the next day, all the members of Hafizullah Hamin's cabinet were asked to come to the radio and TV station and they were all arrested and put in jail. The tragic thing for me was the destruction. Doors and windows were shattered, and some of our colleagues had been killed. One of them had just got married a couple of days before the invasion. The change of government was completed by the morning of December the 28th, 1979. President Amin had been killed, and the Soviet loyalist, Barbara Kormal, was installed in power. We didn't produce any programmes in the aftermath of the invasion. We just played patriotic songs for a week. Occasionally we would play a commentary about the revolution too. The TV station was out of action as well, although when Babrak Karmel returned from Russia, it went back on air. After Amin's death, Radio Kobol broadcast a speech from Babra Karmal to the Afghan people, claiming that he had to take action because of Amin's depression and cruelty. After the invasion, I worked at the radio station for one more year, and then I was told to leave. So I went back to teaching history at Kabul University. While Shah Sawar Sangarwal's life was returning to normal, opposition to the Soviet occupation grew. Mujahideen groups got stronger with funding from the West and Saudi Arabia. Afghanistan became a key battleground in the Cold War as both superpowers flooded the country with arms. Shah Sawar Sangarwal left the country in 1992 to live in Britain, but he will never forget what happened that day. The first shot to our window, which was not an ordinary shot, will never leave my memory. The radio and TV station was built by the Germans and the windows were made of some sort of special glass which wasn't meant to break, but to stretch. I don't know what kind of bullet it was, but it almost melted the reinforced glass window. I was lucky to survive the attack. Were you scared? (laughs) Of course I was scared. (laughs) What do you do now? My agony is in the system with him. I'm a writer and a storyteller. My subject is history and literature. I spend most of my time at the British Library. I'm researching about my new project. I'm writing a book about the ancient history of Afghanistan. 